Good evening, my name is Roberta Ramo, and I have the enormous honor of serving as the, uh, I think, the shortest vice president of the American Law Institute. And I welcome you to our annual dinner uh, celebrating our 85th year. And I just would like to say how proud I am that we're here in our 85th year and we're all still eating steak. So all very good. Uh, let me introduce just a very few special guests, and I hope you'll indulge me because it, uh, I, I could introduce every single one of you, and each of you, including all of our guests, would be so extraordinary, and it's part of the reason that the American Law Institute is the remarkable place that it is. Uh, but let me start first uh, with uh, my wonderful friend, Shirley Trainer, Mike's wife. Uh, Shirley, I, I'm not... Please stand up. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I, I told Shirley, Mike, that I wanted her to sit at my table, but Rod outbid me, so it was uh, kind of a problem. Uh, Mike's wonderful daughters, uh, Kathleen DeRose and her husband Frank DeRose, Elizabeth Fowler, uh, and, her, uh, and Thomas Trainer, and also uh, Lucy Millard, who is the wonderful granddaughter. So if you'll all please stand up from Mike's family. Let me also introduce uh, a great friend of Mike's, but someone that has special importance to me. Uh, and it's not just because she's a graduate of the University of New Mexico, although that's certainly a good part of why I held her in high, high regard. Shirley Huffstetler, who is a great friend of Mike's. And for those of you who, who don't know, she was the first woman on the Council of the American Law Institute. The first woman on the Ninth Circuit. And a wonderful Secretary of Education. So we're very grateful to have her here. Some New Mexico women really know how to do it. We're also uh, very pleased, and I want to just ask our chair, Rod Perkins, to stand up. Rod, hooray. <laughs> Let me introduce also uh, the Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court of Argentina, who we're so honored to have with us, Ricardo Luis Lorenzetti, <laughs> Chief Justice. And very briefly, let me introduce more about them later, uh, Senator Paul Sarbanes and his wife, Christine. As everybody knows, uh, we are in the uh, unusually sad position in some ways of uh, having Mike Trainer complete his term as president. But all of us in practice know that it's a very lucky thing when you are a, law, a lawyer in private practice to have a law firm who is supportive. And I'd like to ask Mike's partner, Jim Donato, to join me for a second from Cooley Godward. Jim, I'm not sure where you are. I should tell you that uh, Jim is the second partner at Cooley to be president of the San Francisco Bar Association. Mike, I think, was the first. Uh, we wanted to say to your firm, Jim, how deeply all of the people in the American Law Institute, but really everybody that's interested in the justice system uh, in America appreciates not just Mike, but what your firm has done. And so we want to present your firm with a certificate, and this is what it says. The American Law Institute expresses its appreciation to the Cooley firm for its recognition of the importance of the work of the Institute and for the firm's unstinting support of the Institute through the service of Michael Trainer as president of the Institute from July 2000 to May 2008. On behalf of the Institute, this certificate of appreciation is signed by Lance Liebman, its director, and Roberta Cooper Ramo, its first vice president, for presentation to the law firm on May 20th, 2008, during the Institute's annual meeting. So please convey our appreciation to your firm, and I would just like to let you say a word or two.
Thank you so much, uh, Roberta. I have to say I am just thrilled and honored to be here tonight on behalf of Cooley Goward Cronish to accept the Institute's recognition. There are many avenues and forms of pro bono and public service. The mission of this institute to improve the law and the administration of justice is one of the highest forms of that service. It's been the great privilege of Cooley, the extraordinary privilege of Cooley, to be able to contribute to the mission of the institute by supporting our partner, Mike Trainer as, as president. And we are extraordinarily grateful that we've had the opportunity to make that contribution and, and to get the uh, institute's uh, recognition tonight. Um, I also wanted to say while I'm here, uh, on, a, on a personal note, how grateful I and the members of my firm are to Mike and how deep our affection is for him and our appreciation for him is as a colleague in our firm. He joined Cooley in 1963. I won't tell you where I was in 1963, but he, 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 joined, he joined Cooley in 1963 and over 40 years of practice at our firm, he has consistently held himself and the people he's worked with to the highest possible legal standards and client service. He has been an incredibly generous mentor to many young lawyers, to me and to other people in this room. And he has shown through his personal example what a great privilege it is to give back to our community, give back to our country through service and organizations like the Institute. And it's in that spirit of service that I'm, I'm very grateful to accept this recognition of Cooley. Thank, Thank you. you, Jim. It is uh, so much fun for me to have a chance uh, to introduce Senator Paul Sarbanes, who will introduce our evening's dinner speaker. Uh, I was asking Senator Sarbanes, uh, I, I told him the truth, which was earlier in the day it occurred to me to call a friend of mine from Albuquerque uh, who speaks Greek very well and to ask him what the Greek word for mensch was. <laughs> because uh, Paul Sarbanes is what we hope for every public servant to be, uh, and that is, among other things that I'll tell you about, a mensch. Uh, senator Sarbanes is the, was the longest serving senator from Maryland in the history of the state. He was Mike's classmate at Harvard Law School and has remained his good friend. His kindness to the American Law Institute through Mike's good offices has included his speaking to this very same dinner. Senator Sarbanes graduated from Princeton, was a Rhodes Scholar, and of course attended Harvard Law School with Mike. His life is not the American dream, it is the American ideal. The child of Greek immigrants, he has used the manifest opportunities of our country and his great mind and heart to work for the betterment of us all. And in fact, he and his wife have contributed even more to our country in uh, their son, who is now a wonderful member of the House of Representatives. So it's good to know that our country's government is not without a Sarbanes at any moment. Very few senators in the history of our country have their names on a single piece of legislation that responded to a national crisis of confidence. In his case, the very heart of the structure of our commercial life, and he responded with a practical legislative solution that works and has given corporate shareholders and directors the confidence that the true financial picture of a corporation is being portrayed to them. Sarbanes-Oxley was and is an example of something that has worked. Senator Sarbanes won the Paul H. Douglas F. Uh, Douglas Ethics in Government Award for his work, and it is, as always, an honor to have him here, and I ask him to come and introduce our evening speaker, Senator Sarbanes. Thank you. Well, Roberta, thank you. Thank you very, very much for a generous introduction, and I want to thank uh, the ALI for this opportunity I realize you're taking a real gamble. You know, former senators don't get to a microphone very often, and there's a great danger when they, when they get the opportunity, they're gonna abuse it. So I'm, I'm very mindful that I'm to be short and brief this evening, but this is, a, this is an opportunity that I really uh, treasure. And I, I, before I turn the mic, I wanna wish Roberta the very best. It's, She's going to assume these very important responsibilities. And um, 
the LA, ALI is a very wise uh, institution, and so the, you pick very carefully your, your leadership, and I think you've done, a, once again, an excellent job in the, in the succession. So, Roberta, we wish you the very best as you're about to assume uh, your responsibilities. And I, And I'd like to echo the remarks that were made just a few moments ago about the Cooley Law Firm and uh, their support that they gave Michael over the years, uh, which enabled him to do so many of the really wonderful things uh, that he's done. That's, in my view, what law firms ought to be all about. They're really very strong institute, properly done, very strong institutions in the workings of, of our society and can, and can make an enormous difference, particularly in supporting what I call public service in the private sector, uh, which I think is a very important concept that, uh, that we need to, uh, to keep in mind. So thank you very much to the, to the Cooley uh, Law Firm, with whom Michael was He's been with them for over 40 years, close to 45 years now. But one thing about Mike Trainer is his stability and commitment. Over four decades with the same law firm, 52 years he and Shirley have been married. So, yeah, and uh, Fifty-one years ago, this coming September, uh, Mike Trainer and I entered the Harvard Law School uh, together. Uh, we met one another early on, and in fact, we uh, formed a study group along with some others in our first year at Harvard. Uh, the others dropped by the wayside in subsequent years, but Mike and I kept up this a study group all the way through. And um, Michael, thank you very much for helping me as we worked our <laughs> way through law school. I'm, I'm prepared to acknowledge it here in front of, in, in front of, all, of all your colleagues and in front of, of your family. And I'm delighted to, to see Kathleen and her husband and, and Liz and Tom here with us this evening. Uh, this evening as well. I have watched Michael over the years, ever since we received our law degrees together, and I've watched with admiration as he's taken on one formidable challenge after another, or one important responsibility. As a practi uh, practitioner, as a teacher, as a scholar, in positions of leadership in the legal profession, most notable, the head of the ALI, but his work with the Environmental Law Institute and with the Lawyers Committee for Civil uh, Rights. In every aspect of that work, Mike Trainer has upheld and advanced the highest standards of the profession and the abiding principles of our Constitution. The Ninth Circuit of which uh, Judge Shirley Huffstetler was such a distinguished member, uh, gave Mike Trainer, as many of you know, just a few years ago, the uh, John P. Frank Outstanding Lawyer Award for the Ninth Circuit. And in that, they said it was in recognition of outstanding character and integrity, dedication to the rule of law, proficiency as a trial and appellate lawyer, success in promoting collegiality among members of the bench and bar, and a lifetime of service to the federal courts of the Ninth Circuit. I have to say, I think the Ninth Circuit acted wisely, I think one might say judiciously, in making uh, that award to to Mike Trainer. Michael has written, of course, uh, 
a great deal on a number of subjects, but foremost among them are the First Amendment, of the legal profession and the rule of law and the responsibilities of, of citizenship. And throughout all those writings, I think the, the underlying fundamental is his very deep commitment to and understanding of the principles that are embraced within uh, the U.S. Constitution. He really, in many respects, has practiced law and the profession at its very highest level in a way that has served not only our own society, but has had an impact, I think, internationally as well. And we're deeply honored that the Chief Justice is here from Argentina with us, uh, with us this evening. Mike Trainer is one of the most decent, fair, and honest people I have ever known. He has an innate sense of justice, a deep and passionate concern to help build a just and decent society, and a rock-ribbed integrity in a time when so many appear to have lost their moral compass. He's had an impact on the profession in our society, which I think is profound. I can't tell you what this friendship that began in law school more than 50 years ago and has continued for half a century has meant to me. And I'm honored tonight to introduce your president and my friend, Mike Trainer. like to just stand up here and bask in that for a moment. <laughs> Thank you, Roberta, Jim, and Paul, for your lovely and heartening words. It is just splendid of you to say those lovely remarks about me and our family. And I'm so pleased our family could be here tonight, and Shirley Hufstetter, who came all the way from California. Roberta brings extraordinary leadership to the Institute. Paul and Christine are dear friends from law school days, as Paul has mentioned, and Paul is my ideal public servant. Thank you to the marvelous staff of the American Law Institute, to you, my friends and colleagues, and to my firm. It has been a privilege to work with the with our director, Lance Liebman, and our deputy director, Elena Capella. The last eight years have been challenging and rewarding, as well as filled with friendship and good humor. For example, our distinguished nominating committee chairman, Gerhard Casper, saying in San Francisco last year, I want to emphasize that the governor of our state and I are the only two people who pronounce California properly. <laughs> Though the governor does it with an Austrian accent, at last. <laughs> and our masterful vice president, Alan Black, saying, I had a speaker at microphone one, but he's either given up or fainted. <laughs> so I'll miss being your president. And I look forward to 2023 when I can hear a speaker say that in, the, in its 100th year, the American Law Institute continues to be a prized institution in the life of our country. Yeah. 
1923, our founders' grand vision was to restate American law in critical areas. The project succeeded. We are now in our third series of restatements and have published other important work and sponsored conferences to improve the law and the administration of justice in a scholarly and scientific manner. Will the Institute continue to have the vision of its founders? We are called upon not simply <coughs> to clarify the law, but also to help shape the frontiers of the law. To realize our full potential, we must identify worthy projects that take less than five years to complete, <laughs> and so that we can continue to attract talented reporters, including those from relevant disciplines outside the law. We must be prepared to move promptly and decisively, yet without risking the quality of our work. In past years, much of this work has been in the private law area. In future years, the Institute is likely to be called upon to address more issues of public law, including criminal law and elections law. Important frontiers in both law and custom stand to benefit from the Institute's scrutiny. The global implications of our work are increasing. Tonight, in concrete terms, I will discuss two long-time global challenges, liberty and equality. Over 2,500 years ago, Heraclitus said that the major problem of human society is to combine that degree of liberty without which law is tyranny with that degree of law without which liberty becomes license. The first sentence of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reads, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. But liberty and equality remain inaccessible to billions of people in the world, including people in highly developed countries such as our own. How can the ALI contribute to the public discourse and attendant formation of opinion and possible action. I begin with the idea and ideal of equality. The Supreme Court has created the opportunity for a new dialogue. In her 2003 opinion for the court in Grutter v. Bollinger, which by a narrow margin approved the use of race as a factor in admissions at the Michigan Law School, Justice O'Connor predicted, 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. In her concurring opinion, Justice Ginsburg said, from today's vantage point, one may hope, but not firmly forecast, that over the next generation's span, progress toward non-discrimination and genuinely equal opportunity will make it safe, safe to sunset affirmative action. She also pointed out that the court's observation that race conscious programs must have a logical endpoint accords with international understanding. If we take these two distinguished jurists at their word, the country has only 20 years to develop a new approach to the struggle that produced Brown versus Board of Education and that continues today. <clears throat> Will our country accept this challenge or ignore it? In his book, The New American Story, former Senator and Rhodes Scholar Bill Bradley writes, when the opposition shrinks the playing field, we shouldn't agree to play on it. We should instead redefine the game. In our country, the time has come to redefine and enlarge the conversation about race and equality to one that encompasses human rights. Engaging the Institute 
in a public conversation about civil rights on the larger frontier of human rights is neither a radical notion nor a new one. It builds on ideas initiated over 60 years ago. In 1945, <clears throat> the Institute made possible the statement of essential human rights, which contributed to the Universal Declaration and includes the right to education, to adequate food, food and housing, and health care and employment, as well as protection against arbitrary discrimination. Contemporaneously, in 1947, the NAACP presented to the United Nations its appeal to the world. It invoked the language <clears throat> and the power of human rights to address racial discrimination. Despite its eloquence and moderation, the appeal was rebuffed. By 1950, the NAACP had decided to limit its focus and struggle to domestic, civil, and political rights. The story is well told by historians Carol Anderson in her book, Eyes Off the Prize, and Mary Dudziak in her book, Cold War Civil Rights. The developing law of human rights internationally, as well as in state constitutions, is not the only source of ideas, but it provides an enlightened perspective to examine how civil rights as we know them could be strengthened by human rights to engage scholars and our members and to influence public opinion and law. Justice Ginsburg has suggested both that contemporary human rights documents distinguish between policies of oppression and measures designed to accelerate de facto equality, and that we are losers if we neglect what others can tell us about endeavors to eradicate bias against women, minorities, and other disadvantaged groups. What do others tell us about such endeavors? In March 2008, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination made two key recommendations to the United States to reinforce the prohibition of racial discrimination by laws that are dis discriminatory in effect, although not necessarily in purpose, and to ad address discrimination by private acts. As we have demonstrated in our other recent projects, we have much to learn from our international colleagues. Much of this new dialogue will be in electronic forums and will relate both to equality and to liberty. In addition to the digital divide between those with access to the internet and those without, another critical divide now exists. That divide is between people in freedom-loving countries, which with rare exceptions do not censor or punish speech, and people living under authoritarian regimes, which not only censor speech, but also imprison those who speak in impermissible ways or who seek information about prohibited subjects. China and other countries have proved it possible to impose authoritarian controls on the internet. And sadly, some companies in the United States have facilitated such controls. The current debate also may be conducted in world trade terms. For example, the European Parliament recently decided by a vote of 571 to 38 to treat internet censorship by national governments as a trade barrier. Such an idea, especially ado if adopted as a European Union law, could influence both trade negotiations and developing trade law. As we continue the ALI's own grand project on world trade law principles, we should stay attuned to the connections between trade and human rights. I now turn specifically to the idea of liberty, especially to the challenge that terrorism presents to both liberty and security.
among the Institute's great strengths is its nonpartisan approach to the law. We would dilute that strength if we were to take positions either on political issues or without sustained analysis and rigorous scholarship. What do we do? We invite judges, law teachers, and lawyers to become members of the ALI and participate actively in our work, regardless of their personal or political philosophies. We appreciate the many and varied contributions they make to ALI, to government, and to society. Because of this, ALI's work stands the test of time. We celebrate our ability to resolve differences without regard to partisan politics and in a spirit of friendship and collegiality. Repression and lawlessness transcend party boundaries. Assaults on liberty have come from past administrations, both Republican and Democratic. President Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. President Wilson urged Congress to enact the Sedition Act of 1918. And President Roosevelt authorized the internment of US citizens of Japanese ancestry. I have been careful, without being silent, to distinguish my personal views from those of the Institute. But I cannot be silent as a citizen in, in view of what I view as the oppressive, relentless, and lawless attack by our own government on the rule of law and on liberty. Accordingly, I have publicly addressed the illegality of torture, the obligations of citizenship in a time of repression, judicial independence as a cornerstone of liberty, governmental secrecy, and the assaults by our government on constitutional rights, the separation of powers, and the Geneva Conventions. I speak tonight about the failure of our own government to honor the law. President Eisenhower, in his first inaugural address, called for, and I quote, the power to discern clearly right from wrong and allow all our words and actions to be governed thereby and by the laws of our land. <clears throat> we the people elect leaders not to rule but to serve. Our enemies feed upon the hunger of others Whatever defies them, they torture, especially the truth. We Americans know, and we observe the difference between world leadership and imperialism, between firmness and truculence, between a thoughtfully calculated goal and spasmodic reaction to the stimulus of emergencies." End quote. I suspect that many leaders and citizens regardless of political affiliation, would agree that the rule of law is compromised and these values are subverted when a government tortures and cruelly and inhumanely degrades its captives as at Guantanamo, Afghanistan, and Abu Ghraib. This outrageous behavior did not trickle up from unauthorized conduct by a few privates, corporals, and sergeants, but instead was authorized, defended, and encouraged at the highest levels of our government, and justified by lawyers in secret memoranda issued by the Office of Legal Counsel and approved by the then Secretary of Defense. When our government engages in extraordinary rendition of captives <clears throat> to foreign countries for even more grotesque interrogation. When our president undermines an amendment against torture by a signing statement that as commander in chief, he can ignore statutory mandates. When the government detains people indefinitely and seeks to deny them habeas corpus and judicial review. When the government engages in warrantless 
and extensive surveillance of U.S. persons in violation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and when the government fails to support our dedicated troops with sufficient armor and equipment, when it lacks an intelligent plan for bringing them home with honor, and when it fails to provide caring, competent, and sustained medical attention for the wounded. When a president lacking in executive restraint, the other two branches, Congress and the judiciary, are challenged to either check him or her and keep our system in balance or to acquiesce. Acquiescence by one branch increases the pressure on the other. Unfortunately, during the critical years after 9-11, Congress did not stand up to the President, and many of its members on both sides accommodated or even applauded him. There were significant exceptions, including Paul Sarbanes. But on the whole, both Congress and the American public were uninformed, fearful, and unengaged and they let themselves be deceived. And the media fell down on the job. Despite a few notable exceptions, journalists too often failed to ask the tough probing questions that we as citizens need them to ask. In addition to the repression of liberty, our current government has distorted the English language and cloaked its actions in secrecy. The word patriot names a statute that stifles liberty. So-called national security letters and attendant gag orders play havoc with the very foundation of our democracy. Waterboarding and other forms of torture are called enhanced interrogation techniques, or in the vice president's words, a dunk in the water. Ethnic and religious violence and the resulting devastation are labeled the birth pangs of a new Middle East. Stonewalling and high-level cover-ups are substituted for honest reports, as in the case, cases of Pat Tillman and Jessica Lynch. Secrecy and lies are antithetical to democracy. As the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit said in holding secret deportation hearings unconstitutional, a government operating in the shadow of secrecy stands in complete opposition to the society env envisioned by the framers of our Constitution. This is a sad state of affairs, which an engaged citizenry must address. It is a particular responsibility of lawyers to be champions of the Constitution and the laws of our land. But it is time for all Americans to stand up and speak out, finally, that is beginning to happen in our country. We Americans are a self-reliant and resilient people. We do not need to be coddled or protected from unpleasant information through government euphemism and secrecy. We can be told the truth about what the government knows and does not know in a forthright way that does not compromise secret intelligence or military operations. In an advanced, enlightened democracy, the people deserve no less. In his famous speech to new citizens entitled The Spirit of Liberty, Judge Learned Hand said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, nor court can even do much to help it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, nor court to save it. Over 50 years ago, when I was in military service, our country was emerging from the McCarthy era, and we faced the real and imagined threats of communism and a Soviet regime that had executed millions of people and enslaved millions of others in slave labor. With reference to Judge Hand's haunting words, my father, Roger Traynor, remarked in a speech, the judges whose job it is to apply the Constitution must carry liberty in their hearts, even when other men have ceased to. 
Who is to say that liberty is dead in the hearts of men who are silent? Liberty is not lost suddenly, catastrophically. <clears throat> it is lost imperceptibly by erosion. Who is to say that it is irretrievably lost until it has died in the hearts of those whose job it is to see that it lived in the hearts of others? It would be good to be able to count on judges who, like Justice Robert Jackson in the second flag salute case, wrote, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of political controversy, to place them beyond the reach of majorities, and to establish them as legal principles to be applied by the courts. I am proud to say we have such judges in this room tonight. The House of Lords Appellate Committee recently decided that Parliament's indefinite detention law violated the Human Rights Act. The strong opinions included one by Lord Hoffman. He stated that the power to detain people indefinitely without charge or trial could not be justified unless the life of the nation were threatened that the United Kingdom was a nation which has been tested in adversity, which has survived physical destruction and catastrophic loss of life, and that the real threat to the life of the nation in the sense of a people living in accordance with its traditional laws and values comes not from terrorism, but from laws such as these. That is a true measure of what terrorism may achieve. Suppose, however, the day were to come when judges lose heart, when restraint becomes timidity, and timidity complicity, and when we cannot count on either judges or legislators to protect our liberty, particularly against an executive branch that represses it. Now is the time to educate and engage ourselves and our fellow citizens. The term citizen connotes active membership in our civil community. As Justice Louis Brandeis wrote, the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people. Public discussion is a political duty. This should be a fundamental principle of the American government. It is our responsibility as citizens and lawyers to safeguard our civil liberties, to demand the truth, and to stand up against the erosion of our liberties. Indeed, as President Theodore Roosevelt said during World War I, the notion that there must be no criticism of the president or that we are to stand by our, the president, right or wrong, is not only unpatriotic and servile, but it is morally treasonable to the American public. The subjects of liberty and equality present a grand opportunity as well as a great challenge for our country and our institute. Our government's torture of captives and other lawless acts have debased our country's reputation. Such debasement is akin to that resulting from the racial segregation, lynchings, and brutality that preceded our advances in civil rights. We will survive the depreciation of the dollar, but what sort of survival would it be if we continue to debase our moral currency? In earlier years, our country's adherence to the rule of law was a cause for hope for people, as well as an inspiration to judges, not just in America, but in many other countries. If that faith evaporates, injustice will increase, and the reper repercussions will be global. As Martin Luther King wrote in Letter from Birmingham Jail, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are tied in a single garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Before the Berlin Wall fell, with the consequent opening of Eastern Europe, 
I was not optimistic that such an event would happen in my lifetime. Can we hope for another advance that will link the ending of impoverishment for many to the beginning of liberty and equality for all? Although we cannot expect the courts in specific cases to create systematic progress, we can expect them to implement it and enforce the law. We ought to be able to expect Congress and legislative bodies to come together to address the pressing issues of the day and improve the lives of ordinary Americans. We lawyers can take the lead in shaping the public discussion, forming the opinions, and stating the coherent principles that will lead to progress, to effective enforcement by the courts of existing laws and constitutional guarantees, and, when necessary, to enactment of new laws. We can take heart, for example, from principles such as those adopted at the Global Judges Symposium that preceded the Johannesburg Environmental Summit in 2002. The judges urged the judiciary to boldly and fearlessly implement and enforce applicable international and national laws, which in the field of environment and sustainable development will assist in alleviating poverty and sustaining and enduring civilization. The Institute, if it wishes, could help foster principles of comparable power to advance human rights, especially the rights to liberty and to equality. As to both liberty and equality, new laws may be needed, but they are not the only answer. New approaches to old laws, together with stronger enforcement, are also needed. Sometimes the custom that eventuates from an educated public opinion is preferable to a rule because it governs by the moral force of widespread acceptance. Public discourse that led to disinvestment helped end apartheid, a custom of insisting on liberty and justice for all, not just routinely displaying or pledging allegiance to our flag, could make it unacceptable for a legislator or other official to suspend habeas corpus, condone torture, or undermine judicial independence. Such a custom can withstand legalistic challenges, clever efforts to create exceptions, and pretenses at compliance, and it relies not on sometimes cumbersome enforcement mechanisms, but on individual and collective responsibility. It also holds the promise of uniting us as one nation, indivisible. Earlier tonight, I mentioned Gerhard's and our governor's pronunciation of California. As a Cal Berkeley grad, I am now going to dare to say our rival's Stanford's motto, which is in German, Die Luft der Freiheit weht, the wind of freedom blows. Law is a demanding profession, yet it affords the opportunity to give back to the profession and the community through pro bono work. Each of us has a chance to help build and maintain the system of justice that is a vital element of a free country. We have been trained to know and uphold our Constitution and our laws. We can and must show courage in the defense of our liberty. Our liberty and our values are our best defense as well as our best weapon against terror. In strengthening them, we can also advance the cause of human rights and regain the respect and admiration of our fellow world citizens. If there is a way our institute can help our country make such progress, we will have earned the right to say in 2023, yes, we have matched our stature, the stature 
and the vision of our founders, and we can justly celebrate our centennial. I look forward to the continuing freedom, as long as I have it, of being and acting as a citizen. I step down as your president with all good wishes and my heartfelt thanks to Roberta, to Lance, and to each of you for eight exciting and enjoyable years. Thank you very much. What we have heard uh, tonight, Mike, are the remarks of a true American patriot, and I think I know what the word means. Now it is my pleasure, Mike, to say uh, a few words. Uh, first, let me say that for those many of you who have said to me, how can you fill Michael Trainer's shoes, I can't. Even two feet in one shoe would not work out so well for me. In fact, I was thinking as Rod stood up, I think we're going in a bad order, Mike, in terms of the stature uh, of our presidents. But it's, uh, I think, a mark of your stature in the legal community, Mike, that I have been inundated with emails, telephone calls, early this morning, a fax under my door, pulled aside at this meeting to make sure that I knew how deeply important your presidency has been, not just to the American Law Institute, but to the American legal community as a whole. And that they wanted to make sure that I expressed on their behalf how important a person you are to us. Some of you may not know that Mike took office in the most difficult way eight years ago when Charlie Wright died unexpectedly. And as you now know from knowing him, he put away everything else in his life that he was doing with no complaint to become our leader. His very great mind has wide-ranging interests. He's a first-rate advocate, not only for his clients, for the environment, for the justice system, for the American Law Institute, and as you heard tonight, for our democracy. During Mike's tenure, we have finished and also begun some of the most important work of our Institute's history. He has encouraged us both to assume appropriate responsibility in the international community when asked, and to make sure that we understood that there was a great world outside our country from which we should draw ideas and colleagues. In our work, he has been a constant presence in virtually every project including that of ensuring that the American Law Institute itself strove hard to meet the goals of diversity that mirrored the great diversity of our country. His deft leadership allowed us to remake our governance into a model that at the same time met far more than the best practices for institutions and kept our hallmarks quality, civility, and the collegiality of our deliberations, something that so many of you have commented about that it makes me thrilled that we have it in our room here and sad that some of you think we have lost it in American life. But I think, Mike, in your honor, we will strive to get it back. But perhaps your most important contribution will not show in citations or in any chart marking the numbers of accomplishments of the American Law Institute during your leadership. I think maybe your most important contribution to our work and that of our democracy is that you are an icon of what an American lawyer is supposed to be. Greatly intelligent, courageous, hardworking, vastly kind and patient. A person who 
sees the values of others not by what they look like, they do. Somebody who values his family, his colleagues, and his friends. And a man whose ready laugh diffuses any difficult situation. Mike, you are the person we all wish we could be. So how do we really thank uh, somebody who has given us the gift of his leadership and concern? It's easy. I knew exactly what to do. I called his wife. And having hung around with Bill Webster for a long time, I knew how to call her when you weren't there. <laughs> the council wanted to give you a very special gift, Mike, and of course, Shirley immediately said, because you are such a modest person, no, 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 don't do anything. He will just be thrilled. He doesn't want a present of any kind. And it was only when I told her that the only thing I'd been able to think of giving you was a really big rodeo buckle with ALI on it <laughs> that she finally suggested uh, something that she thought you might want. And before I, uh, I ask our wonderful helpers behind the curtain to bring it out, I want to tell you uh, that when I sent an email around to the council indicating what we had all agreed might be something you would like, uh, the council was so incredibly generous because in many ways we met Shirley's requirements that I want to announce tonight that on behalf of the council we're making a $5,000 gift to the Griswold uh, endowment on your, in your name. Now, a personal gift uh, for you from the council. Who knew with all this that Mike Trainer and Woody Allen shared something in common? They both play the clarinet. And so, Mike, we have had made for you a handmade wooden music stand, which they tell me will grow very tall, and it says on it with deep thanks to Michael Trainer from the American Law Institute. So please. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, because I know that the president and the chair will require it, it's getting close to 10. It's time to go to bed to read those parts of the restatement that you have not read in employment law, and we will see you all at 9 o'clock sharp. Thank you, and good night.